Hi, I'm Zach Waters, and welcome to another episode of What The Gaff Stop Photo Talk, where I chat to photographers about their life and connection to the world through photography. Today's guest, Greg Moranovich, is a South African photojournalist Born in Johannesburg in 1962, he gained international recognition for his work documenting the end of apartheid in South Africa and the subsequent transition to democracy. Moranovich, along with three other photographers, became known as the Bang Bang Club. The Bang Bang Club, which included Moranovich, Kevin Carter, Kent Osterbrook and Joe Silver, gained notoriety for their intense and controversial images capturing the brutality of the apartheid era. The title came about when a local magazine editor at the time, Chris Moraes, began writing about the group's exploits on the field and gave them the title of the Bang Bang Club. In 1991, Moranovich won the Pulitzer Prize for his photography of the killing of Zulu Lindsay de Chalabar, who was suspected of suspiring for Encarta and was executed by the African National Congress supporters. Moranovich has continued his career as a fort journalist covering conflicts and social issues around the world. He's also an established filmmaker, editor, university lecturer and an established author, which we cover in our chat. In 2000, he published his memoir of his time working as a conflict photographer in the 90s with the Bang Bang Club, Snapshots from a Hidden War, which was an insight into his experiences during the troubled period of South Africa's history, which he co-authored with Jar Silver. In 2010, the Bang Bang Club film premiered directed by Stephen Silver which explored the themes of friendship of the group, the ethical dilemmas of photojournalism and the personal toll of bearing witness to extreme violence. In 2017, Greg published The Murder of Small Copy, The Real Story of South Africa's Marikana Massacre. The book aimed to provide a comprehensive understanding of the Marikana Massacre beyond the headlines, exploring the human stories behind the events and the broader implications of South African society. It's a significant contribution to the understanding of this tragic incident in South Africa's recent history, which I didn't really know much about, but we did talk about it at length in our chat. Anyway, I was up there before dawn the next day, and I got to the site of where the shooting was, and the number of evidence markers, they'd run out of evidence markers, the little orange cones, and they were using styrofoam coffee cups, white styrofoam coffee cups. It was just crazy. I started doing it and and I was doing pictures, but really I was more interested in the writing side, the reporting side of it. And as it went on, the mine workers wouldn't let you talk to anyone who was there. You couldn't get to speak. And there were all these meetings and all these gatherings. And But what had happened is that all the survivors of the shooting who'd been close had been arrested. We also discussed the late Kevin Carter's Pulitzer Prize winning photograph of a starving Sudanese child in a vulture waiting in the background. The image won the Pulitzer Prize for Feature Photography Award in 1994. Carter took his own life four months after winning the prize. The aid workers said, do not touch anybody. So anyway, Kevin goes back to where Joao was and he's, he's like in a high state of agitation. And he's telling Joao about this picture. And it's a remarkable picture, a psychotic picture. This little kid is on its hands and knees, and the vulture is behind. Yeah. I mean, many meters behind. And it looks like the vulture is stalking the child. This is not the true yeah. meaning of that, or what is happening, but that's what it looks like. And it's very symbolic of what is happening in Sudan at that time. And we went back to his early life in one of his very first shoots in the townships. I just one day I thought, you know, you can't kid yourself that you're covering the effects of apartheid if you don't go and cover this violence. And so I drove in, and, um, you know, that very day I stopped on this bridge overlooking where there were these battles at this migrant workers' hostel and the surrounding neighborhoods. And I could look down, and it had just finished. And I could see lots of journalists on the side of the ANC supporting residents and nobody with the Nkata, the Zulu hostel dwellers. So I thought, well, let me go there. At least I'll have a chance. You know, I wasn't that dumb. I knew I needed to sell pictures. Let me go that side. And I'd spent a lot of time in 
black areas. You know, I could speak a little bit of Isi Zulu. I could speak Tsotsi Tal, you know, so I could make my way. I was very excited about talking to Greg. So I've been a long time admirer of his ever since I read the Bang Bang Club back in the day. But at the same time, I was really nervous because would you ask a man who's been asked the same sort of questions for over 30 years? So anyway, the day came and I asked him what he was up to. Oh, Zach, at the moment, I'm in a plastic shrouded basement scanning pictures and working on things. But currently, really, I'm a professor at Boston University, and I teach at Harvard every year, part-time. Most excitingly, I'd say, is that I've set up a conflict and crisis reporting course in the summer um, to be held in Padua, Italy, with Boston University, BU. You say you're scanning your archive? It's been some years, yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I had a look on the PA website earlier today, and because obviously you were associated with PA for a long time, I couldn't find anything. I think I thought found a picture of Mandela, um, or two pictures of Mandela. You mean AP, because not PA. That's why I didn't find it. I got the game the P muddled up, didn't I? Uh, and a PA <laughs> is your British guys. I was with AP. Yeah. I mean, I think PA ran their stuff, right. but never directly with them. The fact you find anything on PA is interesting. <laughs> Who've I got? I've got Mandela and, um, yeah, I've got two thir- 2013 and I've got Nelson and Mandela, civil rights activists. Oh, they're just gen- general shots at Inns Chambers or something and one with a what looks like a sort of hammer and sickle. You're one of the unions, I guess. So who holds your archive? Is it AP? I hold my archive. I always keep my copyright. And um, AP was, they agreed initially. And then, you know, as I became more established, they had some qualms about it, but a deal's a deal. So no matter what I did, I always held my copyright with them. Yeah. Obviously with Sigma, I was with Sigma, I held my copyright. Yeah. You're selling stuff through Photo Shelter as well, don't you? I do use Photo Shelter, but it's very out of date. Yeah. Um, and I'm busy getting that together. I've I've been putting a, a collection from my scans together for the Brenthurst Library and Foundation. Yeah, it's going to be on photo shelter, but I've I got to get to it. When I was looking at your website and stuff, I didn't see everything together because you've made loads of films. You've, you've obviously written books published books and you've got this vast archive and I didn't see anywhere celebrating you as one place. That's a good point. Um, look, there is the Marinovich photo photography yeah. website, which is my wife and I, but it's not a, an archive place. No. Oh. <laughs> yes. These things must happen maybe in my lifetime. <laughs> How do you find teaching then? Oh, I love it. Do you? I absolutely love it. So you're a professor? Uh, technically a master lecturer, but yeah, yeah, professor for short. I'm a senior lecturer at Harvard and a master lecturer at BU. So you're teaching photojournalism, I presume, filmmaking, photojournalism, what is it? Visual journalism, because it includes documentary filmmaking. Yeah. And then with the Harvard one is not necessarily journalism or documentary. It inclu- It's any kind of photography, but just obviously my bent is more towards documentary. And what are you breaking down with the students in terms of being a photojournalist? How do you approach the students and how do you break it all down? So it's kind of staged. You have students who are doing visual journalism because they're required to do it as part of their journalism degree. Yeah. And some of them have never taken a photo on anything except an iPhone and have no interest. And so it's about trying to engage them and teach them how to do visual storytelling and to work with audio and video and stills. And that's kind of more or less a boot camp over a semester. Yeah. Then some of those will come to my advanced classes, and I do an advanced documentary filmmaking class, and I do an advanced photojournalism class in which they make a book, a digital book, obviously. Yeah. It's very different teaching those different levels, whereas I enjoy the the work that's involved in the advanced classes more I love seeing people who have no clue about photography, even though they've been born with visuals and audio all around them. 
yeah have them understand how to work with it and that's that's very rewarding the harvard is the the continuing education and so that's open to anyone and so you have adults you have school kids you have university people you have people trying to get their master's degrees and these are very mixed classes and it's a completely different feel when you're teaching 16 17 18 however old they are teenagers you know when you're trying to tell them things and validate your knowledge of something and they look at you in a way to say what do you know what can you teach me and sometimes even after 30 years i actually feel that i'm like I don't know anything. Does that make sense? No, it does. It does. You know, I try and teach as a journey with yeah. the class and I undergo together. Because really, everyone has knowledge and different knowledge. And yeah. people know things we don't know and I don't know. And even though yeah. I might be expert in ABC, they have completely different knowledge. So it's trying to engage them yeah. where they feel interested. And that's tricky. But then also, I think, if people have come to your class, you know, they acknowledge that you've got something to teach them. And if they don't want to learn, well, they shouldn't be at university. They're not required to be at university. So mostly it works out well. There's always the odd hiccup. But mostly I find it very interesting. What I really like is when we dig into stuff that's difficult. And a lot of people come with preconceptions about photojournalism, about photography. And it's breaking it down and teaching people how to look in a much more personal way and responsible way. And one of the things that's been missing from that, if you don't mind me segueing into this, is that I've never taught conflict or war reporting because I just didn't feel it was appropriate. You know, what am I going to do? One or two lectures. Yeah. And then someone thinks, oh, yeah, okay, I can go off to Syria now, or whatever. Yeah. And so I don't want that responsibility. But once Ukraine started, and I was seeing all my generation of people that I'd worked in the field with in the 90s, they were the majority of the people we were seeing working in Ukraine. And I thought, hmm. So I did a bit of research with people you know, who have management positions in AP, Reuters, etc. Yeah. And um, New York Times and what all. And there's a generation gap because of what happened in Syria during the, the early part of the civil war with the execution and kidnapping of journalists. And, you know, these media corporations are so institutionalized, they run by insurance. So nobody wants to hire youngsters, nobody wants to take a risk on people. If you go to a war zone, and this is good, if you go to a war zone, you're required to do training, yeah. hostile environment training, all of which is good. But it does tend to exclude people from a more working class background yeah. and from outside of, you know, the honeypots of journalism. So how do you get a start? It's, it's tricky. So I decided to use the knowledge I have. And obviously, my knowledge ended in about, my hands-on knowledge ended in about 2000, which is 20 years out of date. So drones and social media as a factor in warfare are not something I know about, but I want to involve, I will involve people who do know about this. Yeah. Teaching people how to approach war ethically, responsibly, and safely. My hope is that, you know, some people have enough to get through the first two weeks without dying, which is critical, and then they'll start getting their own experience, or they come to my course and they go, hmm, this is not for me. And that's, that's a win as well. Another consideration at the end of the 90s in the zeros with the digital age taking hold, you were finding people had access to camera and the internet. And rather than sending, say, somebody like yourself out to say Algeria, they would just use local guys. They were using guys who had a camera and who were aspiring photographers, but they were all native to the land in a sense a good thing that's how i got my break because i was native to south africa yeah exactly now if you look at a picture desk and you say well, let's look at israel there is obviously the groups of the photographers going out you know from all over the world but there is embedded with them lots of local regional photographers who are just there sending images after images and images back to picture desks so somebody like me who wanted to go out there I haven't got really much of a chance, apart from keeping myself alive, of getting stuff which is going to be in print. Of course I do, I do. I, you know, and I, I ran the AP Photo Bureau uh, in Jerusalem, which covered 
Israel, Palestine, Jordan. Yeah. You know, I had people, staff working for me who were both Israeli and Palestinian in there. I also had lots of stringers. And some of them were journalists who picked up a camera because yeah. you couldn't get into places, right? Gaza is its own little, even before this, Gaza's always been weird and cut yeah. off. Whenever there was conflict, the Israelis would cut it off. So we had a strong Palestinian team yeah. in Gaza. We had a strong Palestinian team in the West Bank. And we were always upskilling people and, and teaching them about, you know, and obviously these these are lands that are torn by conflict and generations of conflict. Yeah, Everyone's got their bias and their preferences. You know, there's very few Palestinians or Israelis who, you know, are absolutely neutral. It would be impossible, I think. And we don't expect that. But, you know, making sure people do honest mm. journalism is the key. So I get what you're saying about not being able to travel that easily. But I think that's part of the digital revolution is that at a certain level of what publications want, they're happy just to get content. Yeah. Yeah, right? so they're I'm not man. worried about more ele elevated thinking. But I think for publications that are serious, they want to work with people that they trust and know, be that people in country or people that they want to travel in there. So, But the market for journalism is terrible at the moment. So that yeah, yeah. was a double kick in the teeth for all of us. Yeah. I do notice with your Israeli-Palestine stuff, you were using square format black and white. Where did that come from? <laughs> so I was photographing color negative on, you know, 35 mil cameras for AP. Yeah. And then I wanted to keep, I've always wanted, throughout my career, I've always had a black and white body for myself, whatever that is. Yeah. And then I realized, you know, that Jerusalem, being based in Jerusalem, was going to be insanely busy. And I thought the only way I could still photograph for myself was to use a different format. And so I was using a um, square rangefinder, the Mamiya 6. Yeah. And that helped me differentiate between my personal work and it was easy to carry, it would fold down. That's where that came from. I found a set of pictures there at the end of it. And, um, you know, I was, I was very happy. Gilles Perez, when he, when he looked at the images, said, you didn't waste your time there. So that was yeah. a compliment. <laughs> it's a totally different approach, though, in the distance between you and your subject as well. In these pictures, for once, you seem to be standing back as a sort of observer let's say war photographs and your conflict photographs, you're right there in your face. You feel really there with them. In these black and whites, you've just sort of stepped back and become that observer. There's a real quietness about these black and white shots, which I loved. That's well observed. Um, was it purposeful? That was back in the 90s. Can I remember that kind of detail? <laughs> <laughs> no, I. my idea was that it was the scars on the land. So that lent itself to, I guess, stepping back, that it was more landscapey. But it wasn't only landscapes, obviously. But I think that kind of camera didn't lend its. I mean, square does lend itself to stepping back a little bit anyway as, as a compositional tool. Yeah. and. You know, I had enough pushing and shoving and getting in close with the journalism that I was doing on, on the 35 mil that yeah. was a little bit of relief from that. Change of pace. Yeah, and then your colour work, which you did at the same time with, I presume, Arafat and the street stuff you were doing. Mm. Was that at the same time as the black and white square stuff? So... I guess 80% of the time I would carry that black and white camera with me as well and I'd pick out the occasional shot. Yeah. But I wouldn't try and, you know, think on the website, and I've got very little of that work up there, but I think on the website I've got some of the, there was a kind of drawn out few days battle in Ramallah and I think that's on the website. And I don't think I used the black and white at all in that because it was just so intense and important to get the news photographs that I let the black and white sit at the back. It was at the same time, at the same period, was it? Oh, same period, yeah, yeah, same period, but not yeah. simultaneous. And the difference between the colour work in the crowds and journalistic 
photography, the reportage photography is so different to that black and white. I was actually quite taken back when I saw it. It was you I never expected when I saw them. It was a lovely, they're lovely. I think they're a different mindset and and, and I really like them. Uh, was, thank you. Thank you. I, I love that work. I'm, I, I really am happy with that. Is there not something in the pipeline in the future for a big retrospective of your work? Because that's not something you're not wanting to do or? Oh, it is. I do want to do, I don't know about exhibitions, but certainly I want to do books. And that's what the scanning and the editing yeah. I've been doing has been towards that. So the kind of on the periphery, I have some skeletons of books. Um, but for the main body of work, it's very tricky. Work that spans a long time in a country that you live in, like South Africa. Yeah. I'm finding it impossible to pull a single monologue out of it. I keep thinking, oh, maybe it can be a series of books. And I don't know if that's a cop art or a great idea. Not that it's original, but um, but the other work is easier. Like the Israel Palestine work could easily be a book. I think my Komora's work could be a little zine. I think my work from Somalia, not that I think I would want to do a book with that, but there's sets, there's entire sets. Is it all book worthy? Probably not. But certainly the South African stuff has got a lot of nuance and coding that doesn't appear in photographs that, you know, people with knowledge read, so you want to put it in a larger format. As you can tell, I'm talkative, so I'm never going to be one of those people who doesn't put captions or anecdotes in a book. That's interesting, isn't it? Mm. I think it has to be one book. That's great. You're going to edit it, Zach. That's fantastic. Uh, do you know what, mate? I've, I would love to. But it has to be one book because what what we're looking at here, 85, 95, 2005. 85 until 2013, 2019. Yeah. You fitted so much in from the end of the 80s for the next 15 years. You, I'm not going beyond the, the zeros. You fitted so much in there. It, there's a sort of timeline. As you say, you know, you look at the Bang Bang Club book, you're not just talking about Soweto and South Africa. You're talking about Croatia. You're talking about um, the other places you're going to. And I think when people haven't read Bang Bang Club, they're just associated mm. with this romantic film of four guys shooting in the middle of troubles in, in South Africa. But it's actually not. But we'll go into that a bit more later. But mm. it's actually not. Visually, it's about you and what you're doing in between all of that. In the same sense, making a book now, visualizing that period, because I think it is a sort of way of making some sort of sense of that period, as you, I think you did personally in the Bang Bang Club. I think the Bang Bang Club was, you enjoy making sense of everything and trying to sort of get it, whatever it was, out onto paper. Would that not be the same way to do the visual story now of that whole period because your life's been dictated by photographs, hasn't it? Um, perhaps. <laughs> it's quite a statement, that wasn't I'll it? I'll tell you how I think about it. So, but it, but it is. It, it, yeah, I, but it has, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're a photo uh, uh, journalist. You were there for the reasons to take pictures. You met people because you were there to take pictures. You nearly died a few times because you were there to take pictures and your friend sadly died. Was it because of the pictures or were the pictures the result of me just wanting to be there it, and witness these Well, things? yeah, that's a really good point. I and, know. and if we look at the Bang Bang Club, you know, obviously you correct what you speak about this wider sphere outside of South Africa, you know, there's Angola and Somalia and Rwanda and Croatia, Croatia and Chechnya and whatever I else. I yeah. Afghanistan, of course. and um, But when you write about it, it's easy to link these things because the gaps in between are fillable. There's no void, right? You can talk through it. Mm. But with photography, if you think of a photography book that would include all these places, our presence in these places, or my presence in these places, is so sporadic. You know, okay, Croatia and Bosnia spent a lot of time. But Somalia... It was a reasonable amount of time, but, you know, once world interest ended, Somalia has been going on and on and on as a country and as a society. I haven't photographed it. Hmm. Rwanda, I did 
several trips, but you know, so so it's kind of this telescoping in, and I feel it doesn't do justice to the larger story. And I would not know how to put that with the South African work, just technically, page by page. How would I put this work together? You know, there's black and white, color, good photography, bad photography, photography where all I'm trying to do is learn how to be a technical photographer and actually capture something on film to when I'm, you know, confident about all those things and doing vastly different things with the camera. What does that look like on the page? I mean, even on a page, black and white and color, I hate it. If you look at people whose work I really admire, um, Santu Mofoking, the late Santu Mofoking, mm. he did a book with Steedl or Steidl, however one pronounces it, but it was a collection. And it was a set of stories that were done in separate little soft covered books put into a box. And that was his, their way of getting around that, that issue, because that's got his, his work from Europe at Auschwitz, it's got his South African, mm. you know, it's got all different periods. And he's done it as a kind of story, storified each book as a single story. Then you look at Kudelka, I don't know if you've seen uh, his, his monograph, but it's all black and white. And it logically follows his stuff from when he was doing stage work and real, that kind of Czech surrealism that was from really 20 years before he started photography, that kind of feel through his Prague Spring and through his exile years, then coming back and doing this East European mining on the expand, the wide panoramic. Mm. But that all works because it's all color and there's a sense of through flow that to me works. I cannot, and obviously that's someone whom we all admire, he's fantastic, but I cannot see my work doing that unless I exclude vast amounts. So I've done a couple of exhibitions of just my black and white work from the hostile war period, the 90s, before and after, and that's logical. Yeah. But then it misses entire things. It misses the Bishu massacre. It misses uh, the Boi Patong massacre. It, it misses critically important parts of that story just because I wasn't photographing with that kind of film. And I'm loath to convert color to black and white. So it's a problem, Zach. You are your own worst enemy in this because why are you so worried about black and white or color? Because it looks awful. If you get over that bit and look at it, it was you taking the picture, not whether it's black and white or cutter. It's your story. It's your legacy. It's your experience. That's what you've got to look at it. You can't look at it as black and white. It's all about you. And I tell you what, people aren't that judgmental about that sort of stuff. They want to hear and feel it. And again, you know, like the way you did, you and Joe did the, the Bang Bang Club. It was a reflective process. And I think, you know, this does this have to be a, an extension of that in terms of the visual dialogue and everything? Now, I honestly wouldn't get caught up with black and white or colour. It's about life and experience and who you are and where you were and the fact that you picked up a black and white, you picked up colour. I don't think anybody would judge you on that. They want to feel you in your pictures. You know that. You know that. I can't tell you that anyway. You know that. In fact, get your students to do it. <laughs> I've, I've, I've done that teaching before. Them. I had a student from another university who wanted to do her yeah. keystone. It was god awful. Um, so I like what you're saying. You've given me food for thought. Oh, really good. It's good because it is. It's who you are, Greg. It, it doesn't matter whether it's black and white. It's not that. And with all due respect, it's not that trivial. It, it just doesn't matter anymore. Going back to the 90s, and I came through with a whole load of sort of really established photographers, and they were really obsessed with using black and white and colour together. They hated it. But it's like, I think that was then, because we come out of that black and white generation, and colour was always like voodoo-ish, isn't it? it was, but now it's all did colour digital, and I just don't think it matters. It's about the substance, the context, and what you're trying to say is, this is my life, and you know? Uh-huh. And speaking of life, can we go back to the beginning? 
can we just start with where you were in Joburg, what got you through your childhood, right to when you went to Swapol, Namibia, yeah. Desmond Tutu, university, and then obviously into the main part of the 90s and then your filmmaking. Can we go to, can we end around the small copy? Because I really want to find out more about that uh, Mind Workers Massacre and I don't know much about it and I would like you to talk to me about it. Can we go back to the beginning in Joburg? So I was born into a Croatian immigrant family, which was there in Yugoslavia. My grandfather had come out in the late 1800s when he was a, a citizen of Austria-Hungary. He came out to make a living in South Africa and got interned in a concentration camp, or in an internment camp, I should say, not concentration camp, my apologies. Internment camp because he was an, a citizen of an, he was an enemy combatant, right? And after World War I ended and he came out to the country of which he was, a, he was stateless. And so he got a British passport, oddly enough, and then eventually a South African passport. My grandmother came out from then Yugoslavia, and they came from the same village, and they were married there, and they came out here. And very funny, my, you know, he, he, that, you know, they're always these these migrant men who came out are always selling the dream life back to the the girls at home. So they came out on on a ship, on a cruise ship, which is probably really nice. I don't know how they afforded it, but um, anyway. And my grandmother was pregnant, and they docked in Cape Town, and they docked in the night, and she was up really early with morning sickness. And she went onto the deck, and she looked out, and she was shook. No one had told her there were black people in Africa. So, you know, so this was the start of my family in South Africa. And they eventually moved up to Johannesburg. And then my mom was the first of four children. That grandfather of mine died young, lung cancer. In that period of when my mom was reaching her majority, you know, 18, finishing high school, it was during World War II. And a lot of my grandmother's family were killed. I mean, this is stuff I haven't written about that I'm meant to be writing a book about. I had a contract and then I got out of it. But my mother had a first marriage that was to an awful fuck who turned out to be a murderer, and not of my mother, fortunately. You know, she was his third wife, and his fourth wife he killed and chopped up into pieces and put wow. in different suitcases and dumped them in dams around Johannesburg. Oof. So that I only discovered wow. after my mother's death. But so she had quite the life. While she was recovering from having run away from this man with my grandmother's help, my grand took her to former Yugoslavia, which is then still Yugoslavia. And she met my father. He eventually came out to South Africa. They got married. And, and then my brother and I came into the picture. So that is our early life. So being of these migrants, most of the immigrants were really pretty racist, at least the European immigrants. They fitted right into that apartheid mindset, even though the Afrikaners, the you know, the descendants of the Dutch and the Huguenots, yeah. who essentially ran South Africa, hated these foreigners because, you know, everyone's just xenophobic about something. But they saw them as allies against the black majority. So that is the kind of mindset I grew up with. But my mother and my uncles, they were very different. They saw things in a much smarter way. And I think if we looked at them today, I'm not sure we'd call them leftist, but they were certainly liberal. Yeah. And I think, you know, each generation finds its own path. But, but mm, you know, yeah. I saw apartheid as a great evil, and I wanted to tell that story eventually. I kind of meandered around and tried going to university, and that didn't work out. And I worked in butcher shops, which was the Yugoslav thing, and I worked in various things, and I did taking people hiking and safaris and you know, with a small little one-man company, a friend of mine who became my friend. And then I kind of drifted into journalism. How did that happen, though? How did you find the camera? There is some insight into your early life in the Bang Bang Club. Uh -huh. 
is mind blowing in a way, and it's really sad. And um, you, you were rich in many ways, but poor in other ways. One thing when I was reading through it, you never really felt comfortable in your own skin, did you? No, I don't think I still do. In fact, but no, I didn't. Because you were saying about the, the way you conflicted with the way the white South African lived their lives and the way the attitudes and the Wenwees from Zimbabwe. Yeah, nicely put, nicely put. Is on my right. I loved that, it the Wenwee. That was so funny. Maybe maybe for the readers who haven't read it, like Wenwe was these white traditions who left Rhodesia after it became Zimbabwe, a black-run country. And they would always whine about how great it was in Rhodesia. And that's why we used to call them when we when we were in Rhodesia. That's such a good title for a book. Sorry, it I'm giving rather. you ideas. No, now. no, it is rather. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What made you pick up a camera then? So I was first writing as a journalist, but my interest was really the black lived experience of apartheid. And that included the townships around Johannesburg and then further afield in the ethnic or linguistic homelands. It was pointless writing without pictures. So I started taking pictures and I'd had a, I'd bought a camera just out of interest, uh, you know, a Nikon 35 mil, secondhand, obviously. And I was not very good, oh, uh, for sure, um, to put it mildly. And I was more literate than I was photographic. I was a copy editor at, at the Financial Mail, and that was kind of providing my money while I went off and then while I was photographing, my camera got stolen, a 35 mil. And I happened to, through someone, have met an advertising photographer, an Italian guy. And he said, no, no, I'll, let me help you. I'll take you to meet this broker, this, this store. You'll get a real camera. These are not real cameras. Again, what are you talking about? And, and so I went to this <laughs> wonderful second-hand store with him. And he just bulldozed me. He said, here, yeah, you're going to buy this. It's large format camera, there's a Linoff Technica. I'm going, oh, this is cool. And then here, you're going to buy this RB67, uh, medium format, my Mia. <laughs> and you've still got enough money left over from the insurance to buy the same Nikon that you had. And suddenly I had all these formats and I didn't know what to do with the bigger cameras. I had no clue how to use them. So, you know, no internet, no YouTube. Had a look at books, God save us. And that's when I fell in love with photography and I really learned, you know, using the 4x5, I really had to learn how to control a camera and what photography meant technically. And that led to aesthetic and deeper thoughts. Who caught your eye compositionally? Because you are very good with composition and we'll go into that in a bit, but who caught your eye early on with the composition? So, you know, I mentioned Gilles Perez earlier and he's a good friend, but yeah. But when I was in high school and had no interest in photography or journalism, there was this kind of very a stationer store that is also a bookstore called CNA. And they were like they didn't have many books. But I walked in one day into one of their stores and on sale was this vertical black and white book with a man's face on it. And it was Gilles Perez's Telex Iran. And I asked, what's that? And it just caught my eye. Wow, yeah. And I started paging through this book. And I was a school kid. I was earning money, meager money, you know, working on weekends. I bought that book. I had no interest in photography, but it was so compelling how he saw things that I wanted that book. I must have thrown it away like a fool would be. They're worth a fortune now, those. I know, I was going to say that. Yeah, they are. So they are. Yeah. that opened up subconsciously, I think, because I still didn't go into photography for several years after that. It opened me up to thinking about visuals on a much deeper level. And I think Gilles' work has done that for tens of thousands of people around the globe. Oh, absolutely. So the way Gilles sees, even though I don't want to photograph like Gilles, you know, that smart, deep, fantastic way of looking is, is what I aspire to, not to photograph like him, but to photograph, to try and aspire to photograph with his smarts and his depth. Yours was a very different war photography, though, wasn't it? If you look, say, at his Rwandan stuff, and that was the observing war photographer, wasn't it? Yours 
was right in front of you. So it's not just a case of pointing a camera at somebody and taking a picture of somebody being killed. That in itself is an unimaginable thing and takes an unimaginable amount of balls to actually maintain yourself and keep yourself there. But actually, the other thing is that your compositions were and your depth and everything was so spot on. And that little bit of magic, if you want to call it magic, was what set you apart, I think. And that's why you never shot like Gio Perez, but obviously the little bit of magic was there, which you were taking from Gio Perez. No, that's very nice, very complimentary of you. Thank you. Where was it? Was it, um, what was the shot? South Africa, some soldier was looking up to the... um, looking up and there were some bodies on the floor and he was looking up the side of a building. You were there taking the picture. Somebody's just been shot and I'm sure... Shell House Massacre. And this was when at the Library Gardens when the Zulu warriors with the Nkata, um That's right, yeah. Somebody was shooting at them from the rooftops. And, uh, That's and subsequently, right. I think it was Argent Provocateurs, the government. You know, these were people next to the body, and that was in this, the entrance to an underground garage. So the light was almost cathedral like. It was amazing. That skill of composition, though. Yeah, no. It's getting and validating it with that composition. There's so many layers to it, isn't mm, there? Mm. You know? There's so many layers. I mean, I've been in war zones and stuff, but I've never been on the front line. I haven't got the balls for that. It takes a certain person like yourself. Um, I think mostly our balls shrink up into our abdomen in these moments but uh, <laughs> so. what you've been shot four times haven't you so yep wow we'd like to leave it at that no more than four <laughs> let's get back at that i'm not meaning to be flipping about that but let's no. what interests me about that period is that you went and covered the swap home was it on the botswana or on namibia border so that was before and that was about 85, wasn't it? I'll take you back again. So South Africa had um, conscription for all white males. Yeah. And getting out of that was very difficult. You could leave the country if you had the money, or you could possibly join the ANC. Who knew how to do that? Very few people. I was young, ignorant. I didn't know how to do that. I did my two years. I thought, no, I'll just, but I refused to carry a rifle. So it was a pretty rough two years. But I think I got away with it because of my Yugoslav background. I pretended I could speak Russian, which I could a little bit. But So that, oh, this guy's useful to us in translating documents and captured stuff from the Soviets who were helping in the border wars in Angola and such. Mm. Uh, So they tolerated my not being willing to carry a rifle and all that stuff. And at the end of the two years, I was a mess. I just so hated being a part of that machine. Mm. And I saw I was never going to do the rest of my army service. And what it was is the first two years is essentially training yeah, mostly. And then you do what's called camps. And those are three to six months whenever they need you. And so I thought, no way. So when my first call up came, I literally got on my bicycle and went into neighboring Botswana to, to make sure I wouldn't get called up. And that's when I ended up actually on the border between northern Botswana and the Caprivi Strip of Namibia, which is might have been where the army would have wanted to send me <laughs> in uniform. And I was there <laughs> quite the opposite and I'd, I'd connected. It wasn't Swapo, it was Kanu, who later became part of Swapo. It was the Caprivi uh, National Union people who were fighting against the South Africans. Yeah, South Africans were bombing. Weren't yeah, they? they were yeah, bombing yeah. The border, and you went there. Well, I went there. I went illegally with yeah. guerrillas, which the South Africans called terrorists, <laughs> with a dugout canoe across into uh, it. Yeah. But obviously, the South Africans had spies everywhere. So, within days, a helicopter arrived, and everyone's going, "That's for you." I'm going, "What? That's for you." <laughs> so they wanted me to spy back on the guerrillas. So after that little meeting. I went to meet my contacts and I said, listen, and they said, no, no, let's get some beer. We put <laughs> our feet in the Zambezi and uh, drank beer and, and made a plan on how we were going to feed misinformation to the South Africans. So it was, it was an exciting time, but I was out of my depth, let me say. 
1990 was a massive year for you. But do you think that was a turning point year for you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Setting the scene in Africa, South Africa, sorry. It was a political shit show, really, wasn't it? Mm, that's awful. You've got ANC, you've got Encarta, and you've got the government all at loggerheads with each other, for those who may be listening and not know about it. And being really basic. That's really basic. You know, there were about another five. Well, it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Those are the main ones. Yeah, it was a massive year for you. What were you looking for? What were you trying to answer? Oh, that's an awful question, Zach. Oh, what I was trying to answer is easier. What I was looking for, God knows. Yeah. Um, I think I was looking to get out of my life. I hated being a white South African, even though obviously the privileges were enjoyable. But I hated being, you know, the immediate thing is people see you as white. Oh, you're one of us, mm. you know, and black people see you and they think, hmm, what's he about? And even if you try and show your bona fides, there's always like this deep suspicion mm. for good reason. What I was looking for, I'm not entirely sure. I think I was looking for myself. I think I was looking for a way to live a life that where I felt within my skin, where I felt I wasn't living a false life. Yeah. And the other part of your question, the exact wording has slipped my mind, but what I was trying to show was the effects of this awful, well, 400 years of colonialism yeah. and 100 technically 40 years of apartheid legally, but you know, it was just a legalization of what had been before. And I wanted to document that. But I wasn't ready to cover violence. And so this violence was happening, starting to happen, this political violence between mostly between ANC, Encarta and the government forces. I would listen, there was this radio seven oh two that are pretty good and they would I keep hearing this, and, I, think, mm. and I, I just one day I thought, you know, you can't kid yourself that you're covering the effects of apartheid if you don't go and cover this violence. And so I drove in, and um, you know, that very day I stopped on this bridge overlooking where there were these battles at this migrant workers hostel and the surrounding neighborhoods, and I could look down, and it had just finished. And I could see lots of journalists on the side of the ANC supporting residents and nobody with the Encarta, the Zulu hostel dwellers. So I thought, well, let me go there. At least I'll have a chance. You know, I wasn't that dumb. I knew I needed to sell pictures. Let me go that side. And I'd spent a lot of time in black areas. You know, I could speak a little bit of Isi Zulu. I could speak Tsotsi Tal, you know. So I could make my way. And I went down, and they were like, what are you doing here? Because everyone's normally on the other side. And, and uh, I just want to tell you a side of the story. And they're like, well, nothing's happening. Um, so they went drinking, and I went drinking with them in these illegal shabins. And these are sprawling one-story bungalow, you know, bungalow buildings mm. with very squalid hostels. And it's called single men's hostels. Yeah, It's rough. It's rough, rough, rough. And Encarta had been ethnically cleansing, which wasn't a word we were using then, a phrase we were using then, ethnically cleansing the hostels, anyone who wasn't Zulu-speaking. And they were making a political war into an ethno-linguistic war, as well as a political war. So it, it, it was complicated. While I was there drinking and photographing in the Shabin, we heard, I heard this whistling, and I said, what's that, what's that? And, and people picked up their weapons, you know, these spears and shields and sticks called nobkiris with these heavy heads on them. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm going to assure it's nothing. So anyway, I'm running with these guys towards where the whistling was coming from, and they said, oh, you see this, you know, when I got to this, they were trying to force this, steel door open to get into this dormitory room. And I said, well, what's going on? And said, no, no, this guy was in here. He shot at us, his ANC. I never heard any gunshots, but I'm smart enough not to say anything. And I'm photographing. And, and like you said, with the wall photography, I was really close, stupidly close. The best pictures from that earlier stuff were with a 20 mil lens. And even then, I was all over them. You know, they just, I mean, I could have licked these people. I was so close. Eventually, 
they forced their way in. And I was pumping adrenaline and really scared and excited simultaneously. And after the third or fourth Inkata guy had forced their way in and the door slammed behind them, this other guy comes running out. The door flings open, he comes running out, and everyone starts attacking him and chasing him. But it looks like he might, and me chasing along with them. And then he goes down. I didn't see if he tripped on his own or someone caught him or what it was, but immediately they were all around him and, and they killed him with spears and, and sticks. And I was there photographing from within one or two meters. And then eventually, once he was well dead, they realized, oh, this white guy's been taking pictures the whole time. And they said so in Zulu, and I said in Zulu, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. And it's like, you know, I understand what, then they explained what it was. And I said, oh, that's okay. And then they asked for portraits. The killers asked for portraits, which, of course, I did smile and started walking out of this to get back to my car and get the hell out of Dodge. And that was the longest, it's probably about half a kilometer walk. And they just let me. So that was my start. And so from going from not doing conflict to witnessing and photographing a murder on my very first afternoon was pretty shocking. It really fucked with my mind. And I'd say from that moment throughout, I was just really, it was just trauma upon trauma. And the kind of guilt of feeling trauma about being a witness to trauma as opposed to being traumatized through suffering violence yourself. It's a very peculiar thing. Ah, uh, a pondor who deserved to die. Exactly. And they, they even had the ethnicity of the guy wrong. He might well have been an Inkata supporter. He came from one of those tribes that bordered the Zulu speakers, and many of them were, in fact, Inkata supporters. So, hmm. And again, that's documented in the book. Mm -hmm. One thing which doesn't come across in the film, obviously, but um, generally, I think, is the people in the townships and the hostels, I mean, in general, life, over a period of time, they must have got used to you. They must have trusted you. They must have gone, there's that Greg guy. He's okay. He's not here to do anything damage to us. <laughs> there was obviously, there was a level of trust there in a sense. Obviously not to everybody. No, but. no, no. I mean, later when I got to know these these child soldiers who fought on the side of the ANC, they told me that they used to see us when we used to come to Tokoza, which is a place we spent a lot of time in. They would debate shooting us, but it always wow. came down to, we don't want to waste a bullet. They're not worth a bullet. So we got to know people towards the end. Yeah. During the first four years before the election, the, the first democratic election, no. People did not trust enough because imagine if I, I was mostly shooting for AP and Sigma, but Sigma didn't come back. The, the pictures never came back to South Africa in general. But the AP pictures, every newspaper in South Africa subscribed to them. Yeah. If they let us into their world and we took pictures of them, close up fighting where they, where they could be recognized or the, the address yeah. of the safe house, they were goners. So there was that. And there was also, I mean, where I talk, where I was traumatized by witnessing one murder, these were 16, 15, 14 year old kids who were taking part in battles, killing people, having their friends killed, parents killed. You want to talk about trauma? So, no, they didn't have much time for us, and rightly so. I can't remember where it is, but I think it's at the beginning of your Bang Bang Club book. We're talking about how paralyzed you felt you were sort of paralyzed by fear in a sense what could happen or what you know it could have been at the beginning of pondo chapter actually where you were going out and you, the sort of fear was sort of paralyzing you in a sense of anticipation but you obviously got dare i say addicted to that didn't you i guess <laughs> um i'd say i mean addiction is a is a slightly misleading term to use. I think, so let's, so let's take it back. So I was never paralyzed with, with fear in these situations. And I guess that's why I became a good conflict photographer is that my brain would keep working and I could keep doing things. So, 
it enabled me to get photographs and also not get killed too easily. I meant beforehand, before you went out, the anticipation, not while you were on the field. Oh, no, well, the fear and anticipation was every time. I mean, I... Yes, that's what I meant, yeah. You know, I used to wake up really early, well before dawn, make a thermos of coffee, and my stomach was just in knots always, you know. I would have the shakes, and fear is... You meant to have fear. If you don't have fear, you're an idiot. So anyway, but um, the addiction side, part of it was an addiction to feeling that you're on the edge of history being made, on the edge of the news, and that you could play a part in recording it. At some early stages, I felt maybe the pictures could change things, and obviously I became disabused of that reasonably quickly. But it would surface now and again, like with Somalia, you know, the pictures. And I think they were important, those early pictures from the famine. But South Africa, nothing was changing because of the photography and showing the violence. And I thought you wanted to be better than other photographers, but you also wanted to get, you know, we would, every morning you would see dozens of bodies wherever there'd been conflict and you never saw them being killed, these poor people, be it civilians or fighters. So you wanted to photograph that thinking that'll show the true face of this war. And so that was a big driving factor. And part of the addiction, right? The addiction was chasing holy grails and chasing a sense that you might make a difference or you will at least document this. And then there's the camaraderie and there's and there is an addiction to adrenaline and fear and overcoming that fear. And being a photographer, you get you come back with photographs, be it, be they good or bad or mm. showing what it was, but there's a material thing. So there's a lot of factors. In some way, the Bang Bang Club film try to portray that that sort of brotherhood that you can, Kevin, enjoy as this sort of unstoppable romantic group of photographers out there on the streets, blah, blah, blah. In my own thrust, yeah, that is the idea. But actually, in reality, in the book, one of the first things I remember in the opening part of the book, you actually go against that and you say the Bang Bang Club was everybody covering it. Yeah, there was no Bang Bang Club. It was in retrospect that yeah. Bang Bang Club and who, which were the people in the Bang, I mean, it's it sticks. I mean, you know, taking it to a whole different thing, Before the Gaza war started, shortly before, like a couple of months before, I got approached by someone who wanted me to go with her to cover the Gaza Bang Bang Club. So there's a group of, there were, is still, I don't know who the actual individuals were, but there was a group of photographers in Gaza who called themselves and fashioned themselves, I guess in a way, after the Bang Bang Club, right? They saw themselves in that. And so, you know, I think the romanticization of it is normal and the kind of paring down of complexity to simplicity is also normal with the passing of time. But maybe it also had a good thing. It it allowed people to feel a continuum with other generations. Then they should read the book. They certainly should. I mean, I hate the movie. I've never seen the final finished product. I saw various edits and I just gave up. I can understand why you don't like the movie, but I think why you may like the movie is what you've just said. I think it has maybe had some sort of positive effects or some effect, but in reality, the book is, for me, I would think it's more an outpouring of post-traumatic stress disorder. (laughs) It certainly is. Isn't it, though? Isn't it? I mean, it It is, and it's also historic, and it's also... At a time where it was the heyday of the analog film era where we were going into starting to digitize and transmit pictures digitally. And this was just a couple of years before actual digital cameras came in. So it's a kind of got a historical apex of film photography. There were larger than life characters. It was before social media. The internet came in just after that. You you could use CompuServe, if we remember that, to get onto these weird fora about is Elvis alive? And I guess nothing's changed. It was an interesting time. You know, the the Iron Curtain had fallen. It was 
a reasonable time post-colonialism in Africa and Asia that things were changing, the next generation was coming in. It was a fascinating time. Yugoslavia was falling apart. Dan was being formed, even though it would be many years before it became a country. In the book itself, it's it's not like we said before. It's not just about your time in South Africa. It's about it's about your. I must say, you co-authored this with Joa Silver, and yeah, you point out the beginning of the book. It's through your eyes, but you both wrote it and both your experiences to make sense of you. Yeah, yeah. So so Joa wasn't comfortable writing, and I'm comfortable writing, even though you know when he actually buckled down and and he he would write his experience as good, but it all turned out that it was best Mm. through one voice. And so we co-authored it, Mm. and I did the writing, essentially. Um, But we would edit every paragraph together. We would discuss at length. It was was a completely joint enterprise. It's not a book about photography, is it? It's a book about you, your journey, seeing destruction, death. It's a soul-searching journey of trying to make sense of this. We'll go back to the word shit show again of different parts of the world and how you and Joe have tried to make sense of it all. And you come out to the point where, you know, you've been shot four times and you lost Kevin, you lost Ken, Joe. Lots of people. Yeah, yeah. Nothing compared to what's happening nowadays in Gaza. A lot of people died in that no. period. Yeah, have you seen the um, the press count? It's, it's horrific. And I was just going to say Joa as well, who had, a, who had a serious accident in Afghanistan. It's interesting. I think if, when people look at the Bang Bang Club, people need to read the book. People need to read the book. Because they don't understand what the real Bang Bang Club is. And the journey it is not about, it's a photographer, it's about human beings interacting and fighting and loving and hating and just trying to make sense of all the shit, really. Going back to our discussion earlier about your, you doing a book about Everything is in trying to make sense of all that stuff. You have to do it somehow. You've got to do it again. I do agree. You know, I think the book has, besides it's as this kind of historical mark of a certain period in world and South African history, it's also very much about the ethical choices we make, about this myth of objectivity yeah. and about neutrality and honesty as yeah. journalists and storytellers. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think it's very valuable in those things because we break it down, we discuss it. We talk about what we feel and the choices we make. And we talk about Kevin Carter's, you know, his photography and his yeah. subsequent suicide. You know, we talk about, I mean, Joao, we don't talk about, but, you know, 10 years after we published the book, you alluded to it, but Joao stepped on a IED in Afghanistan and lost both his legs. Yeah. You know, and, and you mentioned me getting wounded four times. I was wounded four times. Joao was wounded once in a way that is just so awful. I mean, he was in intensive care for two years. What? How do you cope with that? He's just the most mentally tough person I've ever met. So are you. Uh, sure, I a bit more. <laughs> you are. Let's set the scene with Kevin, because you, yeah. you mentioned that. Kevin's pictures is a photograph I show students mm. a lot without telling them any context. What the book did for me was make me understand Kevin and the questions which were asked of this picture it goes down to the ethics things, doesn't it? The questions were asked about the picture. Did he help the little girl? Did he do anything about it? And that is a massive bag of worms, which you talk about in the book, and rightly so. And I understand it. And it's people, the viewer, majority of people may not understand it. Do you want to set the scene with the picture and just briefly touch on the aftermath of the, the picture? Sure. So this was in the southern part of Sudan, where there was a war-induced famine. Joao had an assignment to go in with, I forget what the UN body was. You know, they have these bodies that deal with certain countries in the long-running conflicts and such crises. It was a food transportation, wasn't it? Yeah. Or down the river. Exactly. Somewhere. And Kevin wanted to go with, because Kevin was in a bad patch. He, he was a very heavy drug user, various drugs, which we didn't fully understand. I think Joao had a much better idea than me, but I certainly was pretty naive about it. I didn't understand the depth and extent of, of what he was doing. 
so anyway, he wanted to go with Joao. He needed it. Joao said, sure. They went together. But it was so difficult to get into Sudan. It was a World Food Program flight that was going in. And in fact, Kevin got on a flight earlier and he went to the border area, Lokochokyo in Kenya, which was a staging place for going into Sudan, did some photographs, came back. Like, no, nah, and Joao's like, so they're both so frustrated. Then eventually, like it is, suddenly you can go. And they could both go. They could get in for one day with the flight that is dropping food and come back out with the same flight. So they were in this village. They were photographing. They were, they'd earlier in the day been photographing um, soldiers. And then they were photographing the food distribution and these health centers with these awful scenes. And then Kevin happened across seeing this kid and the vulture behind the kid. And he positioned himself and took the picture, took the pictures and then scared away the vulture, but didn't pick up or help the kid. Later, he would say it's because they were told not to touch the kids because of disease both ways, right? Vulnerable people, especially children, you bring some fresh new disease, bang, you've killed the kid. Or they have other diseases, cholera, etc., that you get and you pass around. So the aid workers said, do not touch anybody. So anyway, Kevin goes back to where Joao was, and he's, he's like in a high state of agitation, and he's telling Joao about this picture. And it's a remarkable picture, a psychotic picture. This little kid is on its hands and knees, and the vulture is behind. Yeah. I mean, many meters behind, and it looks like the vulture is stalking the child. This is not the true yeah. meaning of that, or what is happening, but that's what it looks like. And it's very symbolic of what is happening in Sudan at that time. He tells Joao, Joao goes, oh my God. So Joao goes off to where, and he, he sees several kids, but he doesn't see this kid or that, or the vulture. Anyway, so Joao's thinking, oh, that's nice. Kevin's got an amazing picture, and I'm here on assignment, and I've got fuck all. Anyway, they came back. Kevin processed, and that was on color slides, so processing in a lab, and he invited us to come edit with him. So it was myself, Joao, Ken, at Ken's house with his wife, Monica, because Ken and Kevin were the closest, right? They were really close friends going way back. That's who Kevin was closest to. Yeah. So we were at this nice big light box that Ken had and looking at these images, and it's like, what the hell? Look at this image. It's amazing. The next day... I get a call from the New York Times, who I did a lot of stringing for, and they said, oh, it just so happens we're running a, did you, you know, because it's Africa, we must all have pictures of Sudan. Do you have any pictures of Sudan? I said, no. But you know, I've just seen amazing pictures by Kevin Carter. They're amazing. I described it. She said, oh, so gave her Kevin's number and Nancy Bursky, and she got hold of Kevin, and, you know, you go to the, he went to the AP and transmitted the picture. And in the book, she talks about, we interviewed her about watching that fax. It is, you know, it's a leaf fax, not a real fax. So the image, the printed image that comes out is on this awful quality paper. It looks like hell, yeah. but that image just pops. It's like, what the hell? So they ran it initially on page three and then on page one. Yeah. It had an immediate impact. That picture was huge. It raised a huge amount of money for World Food Program and for the Sudanese feeding. And it also raised terrible controversies. And when later on he won the Pulitzer Prize for it and went to collect it, questions just got more and more. You know, this was, it wasn't just tabloid journalists who were hunting a story there. It was ever, it was like, what? So Kevin didn't know how to answer this properly. He didn't have an answer that would satisfy people. So everyone assumes the kid died, right? Yeah. 20 years later, a Spanish journalist who's, name I haven't got at the tip of my fingers right now, spoke to us at length, it's mostly to Joao about where they were and all this kind of stuff. He wanted to go find out about Kevin, because Kevin had become a kind of photographic icon. I mean, Japanese school children were writing poems to him, immense in terms of cultural impact. So this journalist goes to find this village and Struzgod, as we say in South Africa, Struzgod, he, um, 
he finds the village, he finds this child's father, and lo and behold, that child was not a girl, it was a boy. Despite what all the Sudanese experts told us that, oh, that's definitely a girl, because you couldn't see, right, in the picture. Um, but from the jewelry and that, oh, it's definitely a girl. It was not. It was a boy called Kong. And Kong survived. Kong lived to be 21 years old, and of which he then died of some fever, dengue, malaria, not sure. But the father was very happy that the picture had been taken, that his son's mm. struggles had been immortalized. I mean, it's fascinating. Nobody there blamed Kevin. It's easy to criticize. And I think there's space to really criticize is. Kevin. But, you know, Kevin isn't the one who created a famine, no. led a war. Yeah. Come on. He did his job as a photojournalist. Someone with a different approach might have said, oh, my God, I've got to save that kid. Went and picked up the kid, and the picture was never made. So you helped one kid. But instead, Kevin did his job as a photojournalist and raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for helping many kids. We have to be neutral. I disagree. I'm not neutral. I was never neutral in South Africa. I think we've established that in our discussion. Yeah. And certainly helping the kid afterwards makes no difference to your work as a journalist. Helping the kid before, obviously, huge impact. But the kid wasn't in immediate danger. Yeah. I mean, I've worked out in famines in the Yogodan, Somalia. And I understand going back to what you said about you have to stay your distance. If you haven't been, you don't understand what it's like, the smell, the heat, the disease, the cholera. Even when you're in feeding stations and stuff, or you're out with some nomadic tribesmen and they're all suffering with severe malnutrition, you have no idea the impact you can cause by even just being getting involved in terms of touching the kids and picking them up and helping them. That's not your role there. And It's almost a death sentence, really, because yeah. if you have a cold even, yeah. or even something that's innocuous to you, a, a person who's hanging on to life by a thread, if you give them a new thing, virus, something to deal with, it's over. Yeah. And you've got to stay healthy too. There's that. You're quite vulnerable in as well, being out there. You, you know, you're sitting out in the bush for a week. You need to be on your, your, your A game. You don't, want to, you don't want to be ill. Well, your purpose in going there is not as an aid worker. There are aid workers there. That's not your job. Your job is a journalist. You've got to do your job. Exactly. If you're not, then exactly. all the people exactly. who went to great effort and maybe risk their lives, your fixer, the driver, getting you on a flight instead of an extra bag of grain, whatever it is, you've betrayed all those people. Where did Sebastian Balik come from? <laughs> so Balic is my mother's maiden name and Sebastian is my middle name. How do you pronounce it? Sebastian Balic. Balic. So the C right. should have an accent on it in the Yugoslav ch sound. Um, but it got anglicized. And it was spelt C H. And has he got his own section at AP? That's a great question. <laughs> 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 that was your nom de plume, is that the word? Nom de plume, yeah, your... nom de guerre, yeah. No, <laughs> to avoid the military, once I was, you know, publishing, I had to use a different name. Otherwise, you know, I would have been arrested very quickly. Yeah, so Sebastian Balic took those early pictures and took the <laughs> <laughs> Let's get out of Africa. Listen, I'm going to say to anybody listening to this, if you want a lot of answers to the boys, Greg, Joa, Kevin, and Ken. If you want some answers to their story, buy the book. Read the book. Now, we're leaving Africa. We're in the thousands now. You've travelled everywhere. You've been throughout the 90s. You were everywhere, weren't you? India, Somalia, Russia. We met you Croatia, um, Angola. Tell me about the 2010 project you're working on in the 2010 World Cup. So, so that is remarkable. That is the World Press Foundation. And I'd been a judge twice by then, I think. I had quite good relations, but they wanted to do a journalism training program leading up to the World Cup 
in South Africa, which was the first football World Cup in Africa. And they wanted to train multimedia journalists, you know, different media journalists, different forms of media. And they asked me to be a photojournalism trainer. And that was great. And I met another photojournalism trainer who was Chris DeBurda, who is a wonderful guy, he is a wonderful guy. And the first place was Nigeria. Yeah. And anyway, so we did that training. And the World Press Foundation people liked me, so they offered it to me to be editor-in-chief of the project, which was great. And I said, of course, I'd love to do that. So that was being kind of the editorial chief of all the different trainings, and then also when the journalists were working in South Africa. And that was going to be 18 of the best from the various training programs, the ones who, the best from everything, sub-Saharan, North Africa, Southern, Eastern, Western, the whole 2D. And they would all work together in out of common newsrooms across South Africa covering the World Cup. And that was just fantastic. It was really... What were you teaching them? Well, I taught them photojournalism, but then I was editing and overseeing the editing of video, audio, writing, stills. Yeah. It was also how to look for you know, stories off the main beat, how do you in this position, you know, work? And and we encourage people to get their work into other media as well. And we were, it was fantastic. It was really cool. And I loved that. I thought that was a great experience for me, but also a great project by World Press Foundation. And friends with most of the people still from from that. It was a great period for South African sport, wasn't it? That, that era, wasn't it? With rugby and football. Football, rugby, cricket, the whole titty. Oh, yeah, you play cricket as well. I forgot. We do, that. we do. <laughs> I don't. I don't. <laughs> the rest do. <laughs> Who's your team then? Who's your football team? Um, it used to be Morocco Swallows, but they just kind of don't exist much anymore. So I guess Orlando Pirates is, is my next favourite team. Is that an American? Yes. Yeah. What's yours? Oh, I, I, mine is, um, it's a little humble team in the northeast called Sunderland. Ah, Sunderland. Yeah, you haven't heard of them, have you? I have, I have. Have you? I follow, I follow British soccer, so. Come on, hit me with it. Who, who's the team in England? Like all good Africans, Arsenal. Why can't it be somebody, something like Grimsby or something, or Berwick Rangers or something like that? So you think I've ever seen a match by them, with them in it? <laughs> Things happen by accident, you know. <laughs> Not that... enough to develop a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many times I've said that in my life. <laughs> Throughout your career, your CV, you weaved in and out of editing, associate editing, you writer, photographer, filmmaker which i don't really know much about i have to admit but one thing which stands out for me around the around 2012 is the small copy massacre of the miners now on your website i had a look and there was some color pictures of miners now i don't know if that's associated with the small copy i'm really fascinated by that i know nothing about that and i haven't researched any of it tell me about this sure so 2012, I was doing long-form projects for various organizations, some corporates, uh, working with the Daily Maverick, the startup website that's maybe the only good journalism in South Africa at the moment, in the last 10 years, consistently at least. There was this mind strike happening in the platinum belt. And at the time, I was doing my wife and I were doing a long form project for a mining house with this fantastic guy called Songezo Zibi, who's, who's now in politics in South Africa, started his own party. I uh, hope he gets in. He's great. And I said, hey, you know, you must have contacts because the journalists were barred from going to the mine workers, weren't allowing anyone to come amongst the strikers. And it sounded really interesting. And from what I heard of it, it sounded like, the 90s, there was fighting going on between yeah. strike, different striking factions, diff different mining unions and factions and 
the police were involved, and there's a bit of a mess, but it sounded like the wars of the 90s. You know, people were doing traditional medicine for protection. People were attacking and killing different posing ideas and people who wanted to be in the strike or different unions. And the union that used to be so great, the, the National Union of Mine Workers, had become this puppet of the government and of management. And people would now refer to them as the National Union of Management, uh, accurately. But they were huge and powerful. And there was a small startup union, but I wasn't really aware of it. So I asked Songhez, I said, can you get me in touch with mine workers that I can get to them without, you know. And while he was trying this, or working at it, I decided to go up this one afternoon. And it was the afternoon that some of the mine workers said, okay, journalists, you can talk to some of the people who are willing to be spoken to, the leadership and some. And if you went anywhere near the people who didn't want to be they would whistle and yell at you, and women weren't allowed because of some of the quasi-traditional magic medicine people were using, mm. uh, called intelezi in, in Zulu, um, but broadly called by everyone intelezi. It was amazing. There were great photographs. And then the unions and were being brought, the union leadership from the two different unions were being brought in armored vehicles by the police to discuss things with the miners. The cops told all the journalists to clear out, and I thought, fuck you, I'm not clearing out. So I just hung. And they came, and I could pho- and I photographed these idiot mine worker unions trying to talk through a hole in the armored vehicle to these mine worker leadership. I mean, they, they were never going to solve a problem. What I didn't know is that they didn't want to solve the problem. Anyway, I photographed until it was dark. I went back to Johannesburg, I'd done interviews, I had a great story, and this being a website, I could happily write 5,000 words and it would run, um, and lots of photographs, and the pictures were nice, it was beautiful light, all digital, and uh, no black and white, see? And, um, and I told the journalists who were working there for AP and Reuters and City Press and all these people, I said, listen, just give me a call Tomorrow I'll be writing in it and just give me a call if you think it's going to go down because it did look very dubious. And so during the day while I was working, I would be in touch. And then Spiwe called me and he said, Speko, he called me. He says, I think you should get here. They're shooting. I said, shooting what? Tear gas, rubber. No, live. I'm going, what? And then he put the phone down. I'm going, oh my God, but it's too late. It's an hour and a half to get there. So I, and I, did, I thought it was just, who thought it was going to be a massacre? Anyway, there was a massacre. Cops opened up with automatic weapons on the mine workers. Wow. And, of course, all the journalists speak to the cops as spokespeople, and they said, no, cops opened up in self-defense for being attacked by the miners. And there was a history of violence by the miners against them and by them, and that killed cops three days before, two cops. So there was history. It was possible. Anyway, I was up there before dawn the next day, and I got to the site of where the shooting was, and the number of evidence markers, they'd run out of evidence markers, the little orange cones, and they were using styrofoam coffee cups, white styrofoam coffee cups. It was just crazy. I started doing it, and, and I was doing pictures, but really I was more interested in the writing side, the reporting side of it. And as it went on, the mine workers wouldn't let you talk to anyone who was there. You couldn't get to speak. And there were all these meetings and all these gatherings. And But what had happened is that all the survivors of the shooting, who'd been close, had been arrested and charged with murder and were being held incommunicado by the police, 276 people. 34 people had been shot dead. That's a lot of people in a non-war situation to be shot dead. It was the first post-democratic massacre in South Africa, and it was remarkably similar to pre-democratic massacres. So I got really interested in trying to cover it and find out, but I couldn't find anyone to talk to, eyewitnesses. And I was trying and trying and trying. And then eventually, one of my colleagues at the Daily Maverick, in her piece, like about paragraph 17 or something, had this one thing about these university researchers had found another site of killing. I'm going, what? So 
I said, do you mind if I can't? No, it's fine, because she didn't go out and do reporting in the field. So I said, okay. And then I contacted this university professor, and he said, okay, I'll put you in touch with my people who are in the field, these two researchers. And I met up with him the next morning. And they took me to a site a kilometer, essentially, away from where all the people were meant to have taken place, according to the police um, press releases and what the spokespeople were saying. And there, at the other side, you could see all the spray-painted crime scene numbers, and you could see blood in many places, but also these were these low, broken copy, as we call it, a small broken hill. And it was really where the people from the shanty town, the shanty towns, would go to defecate, because you could be hidden by various rocks and clops for privacy. It was far enough from... Mm. But here were all these sites, and everything was marked, and there was pools of blood and soaked into this. And the earth is pretty red, but the deep red of the blood. And it was like, so I photographed, and the researcher I was with, Tapello, who would become my close colleague in working with me for the next year, did a map, which I thought, good boy, real anthropologist. It was clear that this was not self-defense. This was people being hunted behind where they were trying to hide in rocks. But I still didn't have witnesses and kept trying, kept trying. And eventually, cops were lying through their teeth and they're getting hold of the pathologists and private pathologists that George Bezos is, you know, I won't get into the details for an international organ. But I had enough from this private pathologist that, yes, people had been executed, even though he wouldn't go on the record. But I had enough. And so we told the cops we're going to publish. And if we're wrong, the whole publication would have died, right? My reputation would have been shattered. My editors, we said no. And we thought, we, I bet you the better resourced people are just waiting for someone to publish, and they'll all publish. So we published. Everybody published, republished our piece. And nobody else said something. Channel 4 was busy on something, and he had good stuff. And he go. Um, Gilmore, and but just a few days after that, the mine workers who'd been arrested for murder were released, and I went to go meet one of them who I can't remember how I got in touch with him, but he was amazing. Any criminal lawyer will tell you the worst witness is an eyewitness, there's nothing worse than an eyewitness. But this guy, he agreed to be interviewed on tape, and the things he said stood up to all forensic and evidentiary testing later. He was amazing. He was a fantastic witness. And he was at the second site of the massacre, and he was watching people getting executed. He saw people come out of hiding with their hands up and just getting mowed down. There were two shots fired at cops. Nothing. They they got one pistol from there, which a shot hadn't even been fired from. They executed 17 people there. They had encircled them. They had nowhere to go. They weren't trying to fight. They were trying to escape, as one would. So that was the big story that we broke and kept on breaking. And that led to the book Murder at Small Copy. This place was called Small Copy. And that was a very important body of work. And the book went on to win nonfiction awards. And it was very important. It circled back to poor people being murdered by the powers that be, even though the powers that be were now the representatives of the majority of the people. It was like, what the hell? And there was a lot of peculiar stuff. Our current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, was a shareholder in the mining company that essentially wanted the cops to kill them to get people. mm, mm, A lot of shit happened. Not one person, not one cop has been charged or arrested for that massacre, despite there being an inquest and being found that all my reporting was correct and finding out much more stuff, you know, because they had the full access of a proper investigation behind it. So, I don't know. makes one very disillusioned. I was going to ask you if there was some conclusion to it. So, the truth is out there. We know what the truth is, but there's been no judicial consequences for the people. 
who did this and who ordered this. And those who covered it up. No consequences. I asked chat GPT or whatever it's called <laughs> to ask you two questions. <laughs> and it did okay. Which were those? Have you asked them yet? No. Go on. I'm going to go, now. Go, go, go. Question. Impact of photography. How do you believe powerful images can influence public perception and contribute to social or political change? So I believe photography can, does, and has done. It just needs a certain point in time where that particular photograph or photographs can have that effect. I think the most famous examples are from Vietnam, from the Tet Offensive, you know, from that Viet Cong general, ex in the Eddie Adams photograph. I think the Nick Ut photograph of the poor little girl who'd been burnt by the napalm. I think those were pictures that were instrumental in turning public, the public against the war in Vietnam, and thus the politicians looking for a way out. So I think there was an effect there, but it was, it was kind of like the crest of the wave of a tsunami. That was the way history was already going. In South Africa, my pictures did not change the course of the, the hostile war, and they were pretty horrific. Mm. You know, the Pulitzer ones were astonishingly graphic and violent, and, and it would make anyone think, God, we should stop this war. It didn't. Kevin's picture had a huge impact, yet Sudan is still at war. I don't know. Pictures can have an effect. News reporting can have a, an effect. You think about, you said you're in the Ogaden, you think about the Tigray famine and Band-Aid and all that. I mean, visuals played, played a huge part in that. Can it do it entirely on its own? No. Second question. In the current media landscape, where misinformation is prevalent, how do you see the role of photojournalism evolving and what challenges and opportunities lie ahead for the industry? Oh, you're going to have to join my summer course. This is one of the topics. <laughs> you know, I knew you were going to, you were going to say <laughs> that. <laughs> so disinformation, misinformation, and absolute fabrication is our new world. So whereas previously, us being honest and not stage managing and not putting on fake captions and not editing in a peculiar way to misinterpret the, the truth of what had happened, those were the important cut lines in ethical journalism. Nowadays, you've got all those problems, post-production with easy digital manipulation and AI generated images. So, and I'm just talking about images here. I'm not even talking about the verbal disinformation, yeah. the misrepresentation of pictures coming from an entirely different war, a different time, being put out on social media and getting traction. This happens all the time. Mm. Um, but AI generated images. Yeah, did you see the thing with Getty having, wasn't it? And, and, and Adobe. Yeah, that might be the Adobe, Adobe yeah. stock pictures of of the of kids in yeah, the garden. Yeah, that's the ones I'm talking about. Yeah, what is wrong with them? But I put out that I put that out on Twitter, and I thought, which picture per editor would use that? None. Would they? But but what if it went out on social media? So let's say it goes out on social media. Let's say somewhere buried in the caption, it does say it's AI and even says so in the text that goes out on social media. Yeah. Very few people read that stuff. They see the picture, and an impression forms. Oh, my God, that's terrible. And then later they discover, oh, no, it's AI. It's fake. So it discredits yeah. all the work of the genuine journalists who are facing death and dismemberment and the loss of their families who continue working in Gaza, these Gazan photojournalists. Their work gets undermined. Yeah. Because why would you believe their work if the other stuff is AI? It's it's awful. It's an awful situation. And what it means is that we've got to double down, treble down, 
on being so ethically correct and transparent. So transparency is key, not just that we can defend it afterwards, we've got to be transparent up front with the production of those images into the public space. There's two things I want to briefly mention before we, we wrap it up. I want to go back to something and correct myself when I said you were, you were paralyzed and scared. The word I meant to say was abstractly scared, which at the time of reading it, it really stuck in my, my head. So I apologize for using paralyzed. It was abstractly scared. What does that mean? Do you think I remember writing that? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what I mean, but what I meant by that. It's amazing. Honestly, I can't. I can't. I mean, I, I, I think I know what I meant, but I, 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 I'm not. I'd have to re- reread that it's section. Deeply intense. I just thought it was a beautiful way of saying it. The other thing, we were talking about Gilles Perez earlier, and we were looking at. You were talking about you visualizing a narrative for your book. Have you seen his Troubles book? The collection. Oh, have I seen it? I've got it. Have you? I haven't bought it yet. It was 300 quid or something, wasn't it? Maybe $400 or something. It was luckily, it was a lot cheaper at Target. I mean, I was going to buy it. It was 700 And then it was half that price at wow. Target. So I ordered it immediately. And then I thought, that's quite a lot of money for a book, but, you know, support Jill. And it's going to be. And I'd, I'd seen in 1991, I'd seen his Irish work. In his loft, he had this big loft in New York, and he had some guy printing for him in the darkroom, his own darkroom, and he had them spread out on the floor as he was making a book. And this has taken (laughs) how many years? 30 years since then to come out as a book. So I've been waiting for that Irish work for a very long time. And I thought I knew what it was going to look like, and I was absolutely wrong. So anyway. He's like you, though, Greg. He's, you know, you've not really stopped doing stuff yeah i mean he's he's i, I wish i was more like she but no um, you, you don't you, know, you you are who you he's are so much You're, more handsome and charming than i am so um so <laughs> this box arrived on my doorstep and i'm going what the hell is this did somebody order a hearse <laughs> yeah. the th- box was massive it weighs a ton it's like what it is a beautiful object, and it is unbelievable. It's two volumes, plus an accompanying text volume. It's the most remarkable book-like object. And regardless of black and white versus color, and your skills as a writer, as a filmmaker, and your history in visuals, you can do this, man. You've got to do it. All right, Zach, I'm going to readdress it. You've got to be at peace with it, mate. I think I've just got to let go of a lot of things and just choose images based on images. And listen to how excited you are about talking about Gilles's body of work and the way it's presented and other people's. You need to be excited for yourself about that, mate. You have a lot to give in that history. It needs to come out. And you've done that with the Bang Bang Club book, and you've got to do it again. But you've got to add all your journey as as a photographer. And that's just my opinion. Any publishers listening out there and they want to talk, I'd love to have that chat. Greg, you are, for me, I've always admired you as a photographer, just for your your bollocks, basically, as well as your amazing pictures. But you know what? You're, you're such a humble guy, and I really respect that. Thank you for taking the time, mate. Really good. Thanks, Zach. Uh, thank you for a really intelligent chat, and I really enjoyed thank you. your empathetic questions and responses, and it's been most enjoyable. Thank you. All the best, mate. Bye. Bye.